So let me know, is this visible to the screen? I mean, visible on your screen? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Great. And as usual, uh, let me it here that uh, at any point, if you have any questions or concerns, any issues, please ask questions. I will try to answer them. And you don't have to wait for the end of the class. So wherever you feel like you are not understanding, you are more than welcome to ask questions. So having said that, today we are basically straight away uh, moving towards the analysis portion of this course, where is, uh, we are basically required to have a good understanding about the basics for doing the analysis portion, the design analysis of uh, the machine elements. So when we talk about design analysis, the first thing that we need to be concerned about is the materials and its properties. And when we talk about materials and material properties, the, the first and foremost thing that you have will be dealing with is uniaxial tensile test as you are seeing here. And this test basically captures most of the properties, most of the material properties that we will need in this course. So we are going to work with isotropic materials in this course. Isotropic materials means materials that has the same property in all directions. So a uniaxial tensile test is good enough for that type of material. So you are seeing here one dog bond specimen, which is basically a test specimen that uh, is used to carry out the tensile testing. And this is as per ASTM standards, which is ASTM stands for the American Society for Testing Materials. And each um, type of test for property evaluation, the material properties evaluation have got certain standards. And that standard tells you what will be the size of the specimen, test specimen, what should be the diameter, what should be the gauge length, and how much force should be applied, how you should record the displacement and the loads, and how to analyze the results and how to make inference based on those test results. So I think most of you who have taken the experimental class or stress analysis class has basically uh, gone through this concept. So wherein you apply a uniaxial load. So you, have, you are seeing a load being applied in a one direction we call as uniaxial load. And once you apply this load, it causes stress in the material. And when you are plotting the stress versus strain, you actually see a curve like this. And when I'm talking about this curve, this curve has got different uh, zones first zone is called as elastic region. You probably are aware about it. And elastic region, we know the slope of this straight line is basically called as modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus. And it is nothing but the ratio of stress over strain. And this, con this elastic region continues till proportional limit where the straightness between the stress and strain remains constant, the slope remains constant. And afterwards, the material starts transitioning towards plasticity where you see a yield point. Yield point basically means a stress at which the material starts yielding. Yielding basically means that at a constant stress, material is continuously getting strained. This, is, this region is also known as plastic deformation. This is generally the phenomena happens in most of the materials which undergoes for processes like forming, shaping, rolling, all manufacturing processes that actually shape the material and changes the shape of the material either by applying heat and force or by simply at room temperature, they tend them, they basically let the material to undergo plastic deformation. So this is the region at which the material starts deforming. Plastically, plastically basically means the stress remains constant and strain keeps on increasing. Let me know if it makes sense so far, guys, or if you have any questions. So far good? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, good. Okay. So we are just uh, re uh, revising some of the concepts that we will need to uh, apply in the area or in the applications which will involve design, I mean, design analysis and design calculations. So 
So this is basically a recapturing or revising those concepts that you guys probably have learned in your previous classes. So what we have seen so far, we are basically dealing with uniaxial tensile test. This is the only test you will need for isotropic materials. Why I said only test? Because it will give you two properties. One is, this test will give you two properties. One is called as uh, Young's modulus, another one is Poisson's ratio. And Poisson's ratio is basically nothing but when you are uh, applying a uniaxial load, the material is increasing in one direction and on the transverse direction, you will see it is decreasing. So if you measure the decrease in the cross section versus increase in length, and you find the ratio of those strains, the lateral strain, which is in the transverse direction to longitudinal strain, you basically get that ratio, uh, which we call as Poisson's ratio. And the third property for isotropic materials is the shear modulus, and shear modulus is related to Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio using this relationship. So out of three properties, only two are independent. You probably guys know about it. And uh, those two properties can be obtained from one test, uniaxial tensile test. Does it make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I was basically talking about elastic region and plastic region, and I stopped at that. And thereafter, what happens that you, see, you will see that the curve starts, the, the stress versus strain curve starts increasing. And this is phenomena is known as strain hardening. Strain hardening basically means the material is getting hardened and getting strength. Its strength is in, increasing as the strain is in, improve, increasing. So the strains are in this x-axis, the strains are increasing and the material also starts getting strengthened up. So when I say material gets strengthened up, it basically means that the strength of the material keeps on increasing and increasing till it reaches a point D, which we call as ultimate stress point. Ultimate stress point basically means that point, uh, it's a maximum stress that a material can carry before it fails. And now you see that there are two curves. One is a dotted line and another one is basically solid line, which actually goes to fracture. So can anybody attempt to explain why there are two lines dot? What is the meaning of this dotted line? What is the meaning of the solid line? Why there are two different curves and this is, these curves are for the same uh, material under the same uniaxial tensile test. But one curve starts, one curve actually starts in, um, going upwards, which is shown in dotted lines, and another one starts going down. I think one is true stress strain and the other one's engineering stress strain, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you remember it correctly, sure. And when, I, when you say true stress, this curve is for true stress. When you say true stress, true stress is basically what? It is basically the ratio of the load divided by the area, which is the actual area. So just a while ago, I just told you that uh, when you are in, applying a tensile load, the length increases, but at the same time on the transverse direction, the area decreases. So when you take see area is decreasing. So what happens that if you take this, you measure the actual area of, I mean, actual area is getting decreased and you use that area in your calculation of stress that we call as true stress. And that basically keeps on increasing up. So this dotted line basically shows true stress. And in uh, for the engineering calculations or design calculations, we are not bothered about this true stress because if you guys remember from the tests that you probably have seen or done, you do not measure this reduction in cross section at every time step. You basically keeps on in measuring the load and deflection and the load is divided by the area, which is the actual original cross section area. And that we call as engineering stress. So we do not um, basically take the true stress into account in our design calculations, but we take engineering stress into account. Engineering stress is load, the actual load divided by the original cross section area. So that is why you see the, the ultimate stress is a maximum stress at which the material uh, can withstand the maximum load and thereafter the load keeps on decreasing or the, the stress keeps on decreasing. It's not the load, but it is a stress that keeps on decreasing. 
because after this point, the materials has no strength left in it, it's going to fail thereafter. And eventually the material fractures in the form of a cup and cone fracture. This is just, uh, we are revisiting this concept from the previous lectures or previous classes. Let me know if it makes sense or if it does not make sense. Makes sense. Okay, is everybody good so far? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay, so moving forward then, uh, as I was mentioning to you a bit earlier that uh, we have two types of stresses, engineering stress and true stress. And similarly, we have two types of strain, engineering strain and true strain. So engineering strain stress is basically the applied load divided by the original cross-section area. Yes, true stress is or the load divided by the actual cross-section area. Similarly, engineering strain, strain is basically defined as the deformation per unit length. So deformation, it is change in the length and divided by its original length. That is basically deformation that happens in the material per unit length. And true strength is basically also called logarithmic strain. It is basically uh, logarithmic, natural logarithmic of the actual uh, length that is presently at a specific instant of time divided by its original length. So that is how we basically classify between engineering stress, true stress and engineering strain versus true strain. Now in design calculations, we generally deal with engineering stress and engineering strain. And the reason being that uh, for most of the calculations of the most of the materials that we are going to use, which will be isotropic, and for most of the design calculations, we are going to remain within the elastic limit or the proportional limit. Mm -hmm. So if I go back, look at this stress strain diagram, you will see that the material remains elastic. It remains straight line. The stress keeps on increasing. The strain keeps on increasing. At a certain point, the proportional limit is reached, where, which means that after this limit, the material response or the response of the material will no longer be linear. So this proportional limit is also called as elastic. And for our design calculations, we are going to remain within this proportional limit or it we call as elastic limit. And in this limit, you see that true stress and engineering stress are, are both basically same. They are overlapping. The dotted line and solid lines are just overlapping. So it does not make a difference whether you take a true stress value or whether you take an engineering stress value because we want to remain within this linear region as a, as a design engineer. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Any questions so far, guys? No. Okay, great. So apart from the difference between engineering stress and true stress, what you are also seeing in this slide is of ductile materials, one on the right shows the response about brittle. Now, uh, in ductile materials, you see that you have this proportional limit, elastic limit, yield limit, and then ultimate stress, and then fracture point. In case of brittle materials, what happens that you also have the same linear line, which is elastic limit, and it goes up to yield point. Before reaching yield point, they are the response slightly deviates from linear line, but it remains almost linear. So it is hard to find out where it is going to, where the elastic limit, what is the difference between elastic limit and yield point, but it remains almost linear till yield point and thereafter it increases slightly and it fractures. So there is a big difference between how the materials respond. I mean, how the ductile materials respond under load versus how the brittle materials respond under load. So, if I just as a, as, a, as a question, if I ask you that what are the pros and cons of having these different types of responses or rather uh, what are the basic uh, advantage or disadvantage of having these different types of responses? How would you actually, uh, how would you actually explain that? Is my question clear to you guys? Can you repeat your question? Sorry. 
Yeah, so you see the two types of response, which is response basically means when I say response, it basically means the behavior of the material under applied load. So when I apply a load, uniaxial load, the material starts increasing its length. So it is getting strained and there are stresses being developed. And I, when I plot the stress and strain curve, I got a curve which is basically representing the behavior of the material. And that we call as mechanical response of the material. Now you have different response for different types of materials. Now having these different types of responses, how that is going to help you as a designer or how that is going, what type of common observations can you draw, common inferences can you draw from these two plots? Or let's say just one very uh, basic inference that you can draw out from these two curves or two charts. Um, so I'm gonna try to take a stab at it. Yes. Uh, so if I, if I ever understand your question correctly, um, so the brittle one, it's a lot shorter just because since it's so brittle, uh, it would just crack instantly and the ductile would uh, fail like little by little, like it would stretch or deform. Yeah. So that's, that's good. I mean, that's a good attempt. And that's basically one of the very, uh, uh, very basic uh, inference that you can draw easily that uh, as you load the brittle material and it passes the yield point, thereafter the material does not give you sufficient warning before it fails. So brittle materials, if you if somebody can give me an example of brittle materials, uh, it's glass. glass. I think magnesium. Uh, magnesium is not a brittle material. Um, like, actually, not magnesium. It's a titanium. Titanium, Titan is, brittle. titanium yeah. is brittle. Yeah, I mean all ceramics. If you talk about ceramics or any silicon-based compounds or glass, they are all brittle materials, and you will see that they just simply fracture or crack without giving any notice. I mean, if there is certain impact and the material will simply fracture or cracks away. So they do not give sufficient warning before failure. But if you look at ductile material response, you actually see the linear response in elastic limit, but afterwards the material starts deforming plastically. Plastically means that it will behave as if it is keep on, keep on increasing its length. So, uh, I'm sure if you have done the tensile test, you probably are aware about it. So I'm, I'm just assuming that you guys have seen or done the tensile test. Am I correct? Is there anybody who has not seen that test or done that test? Um, I haven't done it like in person, but... Yeah, um, what, test, uh, what test are you referring I to? I have not That's done right? this. The standard tensile test. I think we did it in materials lab. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I might agree with, actually, no, wait, I haven't done it, but yeah, you do do it in materials lab. Somebody, somebody okay. told me about it. So if you have seen that or read about that test, you probably know that there is a necking phenomena that you have probably observed while you actually apply the load. So there is a strain, there is a necking that actually occurs before the material fails. Am I correct, guys? Yeah. Yeah, yes. that much. Yeah. yeah. And that necking is basically the result of this plastic deformation. So what happens is ductile materials give you that warning that okay, the necking is happening, that means it is about to fail. So ductile materials give you warning. Brittle materials will not give you warning. That's common inference that you can see because there is a lot of strains is going to happen before it fractures. So that is one common inference. Another inference that you can probably draw out from these two charts is if you look at the area under this curve, and if you look at the area under this curve, assuming that both ultimate tensile strength and this ultimate strength remains almost similar in magnitude, then the area under this curve is very much higher in magnitude than this chart, right? Yeah. Right? And what this area under this stress strain curve represents? Would it be the amount of energy it can absorb? the amount of energy it can absorb, perfect. So what it basically means that the more this area is, the area under the curve, so area under the curve represents the strain energy that the material can absorb. So energy that it can absorb. And this is a very important property that is required for um, 
for in materials that undergo impact loading. So if there are any impact, suppose there is a crash absorbing mechanism or materials. So those materials have to absorb impact. Impact basically means a lot of energy in a very fraction, um, fraction of seconds. So that energy can only be absorbed by ductile materials, but brittle materials will not absorb that energy because it does not have that response or that characteristic. So all the crash absorbing materials, if you have seen, or if you uh, do some literature review, you will find that they do deform a uh, lot. And by deforming, they actually absorb that energy. So if you come across any crash absorbing structures or materials, that whole design reasoning or design principle behind them is that they should be able to deform a lot. And that deformations, even if uh, under the crash, if you see that a uh, car bonnet or some other uh, structure has deformed and crumbled a lot, that basically means it's a good structure because that deformation gives, its, gives it the energy absorbing characteristic. Versus if the crash happens and there's no deformation of the material, then what happens? All the energy will be transferred to the occupant and that will be very dangerous. So that is one of the very, um, important characteristic or difference between ductile materials and brittle materials. Uh, and professor, when you yeah. say that the area under the under the curve, is it the whole curve or is it from Y to F? So is it it it, it is the whole curve. That is basically the entire um, entire area till phase, material phase. That is what represents the toughness. Oh, okay. If you look at the area under the elastic limit or the yield limit, that is what we call as resilience. So how much the material is resilient. So that is a different property, but it is the toughness is how much energy it can absorb before it fails. Okay. Yeah. Does it make sense to you guys? Yes. Cool. So this we actually just uh, discussed. So engineering stress for atom materials decreases due to severe amount of making while the true stress keeps as discussed a while ago because in true stress we are taking the actual area which is getting reduced and which is getting decreased. So that is why the true stress of the ductile materials will keep on increasing after ultimate point. We talk about engineering stress after ultimate point it decreases. So that Way that you are considering the area for the calculations. Okay, so uh, another thing that we were discussing about is about strain hardening, and strain hardening is basically the property by what, by which, by virtue of which you are increasing the strength of the material or the overall strength of the material by permanent deformation. So here you are seeing that this is a stress strain diagram, a, a schematic stress strain diagram of a ductile material. So you have this straight line, which represents the elastic limit. After the yield limit has crossed, the yielding starts taking place. And you will see that it is not undergoing perfectly plastic deformation, it is also increasing its strength. That's what we saw in the uh, first slide, that you have plastic deformation and then increase in, increase in the strength. So here you are seeing the increase in the stress versus as the strain increases. And once it starts going in the plastic region, then what happens that the, there is a permanent deformation in the material. So what does it mean that if at this point you want to unload the material, the material will follow this straight line and that straight line and it will actually come back to this point where the stress is zero. That means the material has been completely unloaded. Now at this point when the material has been completely unloaded, you see that there is some permanent deformation that has occurred in the material. Are you able to see that what I'm talking about here? Yes. So if you start with let's say five centimeter gauge length for the specimen, and you keep on applying the load and then you keep on applying the load, the material has started plastically deforming. It has gone to 5.5 centimeters and then you start unloading it. And when it comes back to its zero load position at that point, the original, uh, the actual length will remain 5.5 centimeters. It will never reach back, go back to five centimeter. But if you start at this look point and you keep on increasing and if you start unloading from this region itself, then it, it will come back to its five centimeter original length. So that is the difference between permanent deformation and non-permanent deformation. 
Okay. Does that mean the material is storing energy inside of it from the deformation? Uh, so energy is not stored, but the material has been strained permanently. Uh, so when I say strained, so once the material has undergone strain, it is just like it is, it is basically the, there has been some amount of work that has been done to increase its strain or there, there is no such, uh, no energy yet when the material has been unloaded. When the material has been unloaded to this location, then there is no strain, there should, there's no strain energy left because strain energy is a product of stress times strain. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So if it undergoes a permanent strain and the load is zero, it does not have any strain energy in it. Strain energy is, is basically the uh, work done by the internal stresses. So if the internal stresses have gone, become zero, that means now there is no strain energy left in the material, but the material has been permanently deformed. It has undergone some deformation. So that is what happens. And what, because of that, if you now start loading the back, loading the material back again, the material will follow this straight line, which is the elastic limit or elastic line, which has the same slope as the original slope. And it will keep on increasing and it will not start yielding before it reaches this position, which is higher than the original position. So that means it has, the yield limit has actually increased. Do you see what I'm saying, guys? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, so that phenomena is basically known as that you have improved the strength of the material by permanent deformation. And that is what we call as work hardening or strain hardening. So basically this type of treatment is commonly used in many applications, whether it is sheet metal bodies for automobiles or whether you have a fuselages that needs to be rolled. So many applications, design applications actually improve part this type of permanent deformation in the material to improve its strength or to improve its uh, capability to withstand uh, deformation by in increasing its yield point or yield limit. And if that type of hardening is happening at room temperature or basically less than uh, 0.3 times of the melting temperature of the material, we call as cold working. Hot, warm working is when the temperature, the working temperature is 0.3 times to 0.5 times of the melting temperature. And hot working is when the temperature of the environment on which the material is being uh, fabricated or processed is greater than 0.6 times of melting point temperature. So these are basically different types of processes that actually uh, are used or employed to cause strain hardening or impart strain hardening or improve the strength of the material by using the strain hardening property. Make sense, guys? Any questions? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if there are no questions, so. So toughness and resilience. That's what I was basically talking about, uh, talking about it a while ago when I was saying that if you are talking about the area under the curve till the failure point, that is what we call as toughness. And is basically energy absorbed per unit volume. So if you, uh, if you calculate the area under the curve, that is modulus of toughness because stress times strain, it's, it's not using the volume of the material. So it is energy absorbed per unit volume. And we call that as modulus of toughness. Whereas if you calculate the area till the yield point, which is this point, so that will become the modulus of resilience. We call it as a capacity of material to absorb energy within its elastic range. So if you are calculating the materials uh, capacity to absorb energy within the elastic range, it is a res it, this property is called as resilience. And if you are talking about the capacity of the material to absorb energy without fracture or till the fracture point, then that is what we call as toughness. Okay guys. So that is the difference between toughness and resilience. And next thing is about hardness. So again, these are some of the properties that uh, we are revising or revisiting because soon uh, 
sooner uh, you are going to start working on your project idea and the important thing that the first thing that actually comes in synthesis a solution is what type of materials you want to use so what type of materials you want to select for a specific project so the material selection part is is uh, addressed if uh, or is at is efficiently addressed if you know all or if you have good understanding about different material properties and different um, different characteristics of a material so we talked about the toughness we talked about the ductility we talked about the strain hardening concept and now we are talking about the hardness so hardness is nothing but the property of the material to resist permanent indentation or permanent deformation so if you are basically uh, using a material to scratch another material you are basically uh, saying that if there is some permanent indentation by a pointed tool or not so if there is some permanent indentation then you are going to measure how much indentation has happened so that is going to um, measure or give you an indication about the hardness of the material. Now, this is basically, you probably have seen that from your manufacturing class 272 or from different other classes about your materials lab, about how to measure the hardness. Now, since it is a senior design um, course, so as a design engineer, I'm assuming that you all guys are design engineers now, where you guys have all the basics understanding about, basic understanding about all the foundation courses. Now you are going to implement those, uh, use those uh, subject knowledge for different applications. So I'm assuming you guys are design engineers by now. So as a design engineer, if you have to think about this property, material hardness, how that hard property is going to be useful for a specific uh, application. What do you think that this, why do you think this characteristic is important or, or can be important? So you don't have to worry about all the text that has been written here that it gives a non-destructive means of estimating strength properties, of course it will. But just as a design engineer, so let's say there is some specific uh, component. Let's say uh, you are talking about gears, gear teeth, or let's say you're talking about ball bearings or um, any material that undergoes some sort of a motion or relative motion or undergoes some sort of uh, uh, forces being applied to it. So in those cases, for example, let's say uh, a ball bearing, uh, let's take a specific example of ball bearing. So in those cases, what do you think a material has to be have high hardness or low hardness? Oh, yeah, well, high, hardness. High, high hardness. And why do you think that uh, they should have high hardness? To resist wear and deformation. Sorry, come again, please. To resist the uh, wear and deformation from like the loads being applied. Yeah. So yeah, you are. Pro pro I mean, you are uh, most correct to because uh, what hardness actually helps is uh, hardness in a material helps to resist the weird deformation so if and if the if you take the example of a ball bearings the balls undergo com continuous motion when the bearings are in play or bearings are undergoing um, undergoing motion as well so in a race there are two com um, components as we will learn when we will deal with, with the design of bearings that there are two components in it inner race and outer race so one um, one component of the bearing keeps on rotating some balls also start rotating with it and there is a continuous motion and continuous wear and tear of the materials are taking place now if the material is not hardened or it is not hard what happens that the material wear rate will increase a lot so the service life or the life of the ball or the life of the bearings will be will be decreased or will be greatly affected if the material is not properly hardened so some, in some cases where there are relative motion between two components or two parts, you want the surfaces to be hardened. And that's why there are certain, uh, certain manufacturing processes like surface hardening or case hardening, if you remember from your 272 classes, that these type of processes are used to impart hardness or impart surface hardness to the material. So basically it means that you are only hardening the surface of the material the rest of the volume of the material does not is not as hard as it and it need not it, it is not needed to be that hard because 
all the wear and tear is happening on the surface itself. So if you can somehow harden the surface of the material, that will do the job of resisting the, or increasing the life or the wear life of a specific component. Let me know if it makes sense to guys. Makes sense. Is everybody with me so far? I mean, are you guys following it or you guys are? What's the difference between those two hardness tests? You know, uh, the Brockwell and Brinnell. Brockwell and Brinnell. It is basically the type of indenter that is being used. That's a different, that's the only difference. And that basically gives you a different scale. So there is a different way of measuring the deformation that how much deformation or indentation has happened on the surface. So that is what uh, it will give you a different calculation to calculate the number for Brinnell hardness. And in the Rockwell hardness, you are using a different type of indenter, which is cone-shaped indenter. It will give you a different deformation and that will give you a different scale of hardness measurement. So these are different standards. That's the only, only difference, nothing else. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so you can, sometimes you can use Brinnell hardness, sometimes you will see somebody using Rockwell hardness. So it all depends on what type of indentation or indenter is being used. That's it. And another thing is that uh, it has been empirically found that if you measure the hardness number, let's say Brinnell hardness number, which is given by this formula, and where P is the applied load, this is the load on the tungsten or carbide ball, this is spherical ball that has got a specific diameter and you have got an indentation which is given by small d, diameter d, and you can measure that or calculate that hardness number for any given material. Now, if you can measure the hardness number, then it has been empirically found for the steel that ultimate tensile strength is just um, 0.5 times the Brinnell hardness number in kilopounds per in kilopounds kpsi or kips per kips or kilopounds per square inch or it is 3.4 times the brinnell hardness number in megapascals similarly for cast iron you are basically getting this relationship now these relationships are empirically found do you guys know what is empirical means a lot of data supports that the experiments yeah through experiments you are basically saying that the evidence is so, I mean, the evidence for that relationship is basically supported by a lot of experimental data. So it has been experimentally found, validated, and observed that there is a relationship between the ultimate tensile strength and the Brinnell hardness number, which is given by this relationship. So any relationship or any expression that has been observed and experimentally validated or using or validated using a lot of experimental data, that's what we call as empirical relationship or empirical data. Does it make sense? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So empirical, it has been found that this is related, I mean, ultimate and side strength is related to the hardness number. So if you see, or if you follow um, some recent advances in material testing, you will find that there are a lot of nano indenters and nano indentation uh, testing equipment has come. And what they do, they do not let uh, the material to fail or undergo tensile test and fail under deformation. But what they do, they actually measure the hardness of the material. And by measuring the hardness, they can get a reference about what should be its ultimate tensile strength and what should be its real strength. So you don't need to do destructive testing because tensile test, uniaxial tensile test that we were basically looking at at the very few, very beginning slides, they are actually destructive tests where you test the material till failure. In this test, hardness test, you are not basically doing any failure. Uh, we are not testing the material till failure. You're just doing some, some small deformation or small indentation on the surface of the material. And by doing that, you are getting information about its strength, ultimate tensile strength. So it is basically one form of non-destructive testing of the material to give you an ultimate tensile strength value. So that is also one of the uh, importance of or significant that also uh, shows the significance of this specific characteristic or material property. Any questions guys so far? Okay, if not, 
in impact we just uh, discussed briefly what uh, basically uh, uh, what specific property of a material actually is good for resisting impact so impact is basically means that the energy or the energy has to be absorbed within a very very short amount of time so in so generally the impact testers impact test are happen using two type of standards one is isor impact test one is charp and it basically in both of the test it is basically measuring the amount of energy it takes for material to fracture so here is a pendulum that is basically uh, getting dropped from a specific height so you know the height of the pendulum that is uh, having a mass heavy mass at this location and when it is at a specific height you know its gravitational potential energy so when this pendulum is released then this potential energy that is stored in this mass is actually going and is converting into kinetic energy at this point all of the potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy and since the material is there which has got a notch it the impactor this impactor hits the material and fractures it while doing that it what happens that the energy is absorbed by or is basically utilized by this material and it fractures so material energy is absorbed in fracturing this material so after fracturing the material or breaking the material the pendulum does not reach up to its original height it will reach to a, some lesser height and if you measure the difference in these two heights before the impact and after the impact you will know how much of the energy has been absorbed by the material to fail so that is what the principle is for the impact tester so it is basically to measure the difference in the energies of the impactor before the impact and after the impact and the difference will be the energy that is required to break the material so that is what the energy that is getting absorbed in the material so ductile materials and metal materials will have different uh different energy absorption characteristic so let me randomly pick a student from the class to ask one question so let's say if i am asking michael rohan are you there michael yeah hello yeah so if my question to you as a design engineer that you have two materials now you have a ductile material and a brittle material in which material you think a pendulum will go to a maximum height or more height um i would say the ductile material would would uh, absorb more Mm -hmm. energy so that it would not go as high great so there you go so we actually now basically using those um, those observations and those are uh, those uh, knowledge about the property of the material to to make an inference about how logically the test should look like so if you have two materials which are unknown to you and you want to know about its energy absorbing characteristic you can use this impact tester and you can see how much high difference it is have it is making for different types of materials and that will give you the that will give you a result or indication which material has got a good energy absorbing characteristic does it make sense to everybody guys yes uh, yeah good yeah so, another thing that happens or which is very very uh, critical is that these properties the ductility or uh, the brittleness is a function of temperature so if you actually work in a room temperature environment or slightly higher than room temperature environment you actually see the material behavior when i say material behavior again it is the stress strain curve that is almost looks like um, the the response that you will get from tensile test or universal tensile test but what happens that if you go at very very low temperatures then the ductile materials will start behaving like brittle materials so here is this a chart of Uh, energy absorbed by the charpy impact tester so you have the energy absorb uh, absorption values here and this is the temperature and you see that ductile materials absorb lot of energy at room temperatures and close to the room temperatures but or even higher temperatures but if you drop the temperature then suddenly you will see that the material is not no longer absorbing energy and any energy impact energy and it is basically becoming a brittle material so that is also one of the case studies that has been uh, done and has been investigated a lot during the sinking of a titanic where the material that was used was st steel 
high grade stainless steel which is very very ductile which can absorb a lot of impact but because of the cold temperature the material actually undergo the transition from ductility to brittle brittleness and then it actually loses all its characteristics to to absorb energy so that is also I and mean, at that time when the sinking happens that this type this um, this phenomena of ductile to brittle transition was not known to material scientists at that time so that is basically one of the important characteristics you guys know because the environment of the law uh, of the design application uh, is actually is very critical to uh, make a design choice for example taking the simple example of a ball bearing so if the ball bearings are working in a jet turbine engine where the temperatures are very very high the material for that brittle for that bearing will be very different from if you are working in a space uh, environment where the temperatures are very slow and if there are any bearings that needs to be used in a space environment or in cryogenic temperatures at that time you have to be very very considerate and careful about the material selection so environment of the design act or a specific component does impact a lot on the choice of material so that you have to be careful about as a design engineer does it make sense guys yes yeah that makes sense any questions guys so far okay so if not then uh, the next thing is uh, which is important and which you should know as design engineers as well is that the material properties so far that you have studied are all deterministic in nature for example if i ask some if i ask anybody in the class or any volunteer in the class about the young's modulus of steel or aluminum anything that you can remember from your previous classes anybody remembers the young's modulus of steel 200 200 what are the units it is important don't forget the units gigapascal gigapascal so an aluminum anybody remembers for aluminum okay you have enough time to google it so it's 70 gigapascal generally so generally steel is somewhat around 210 mega uh, 10 gigapascal and for aluminum it has is around 70 gigapascal so this is what you will find in any calculation or design handbook or whatever courses you have done so far whether it is strength of materials whether it is something else you probably have seen these values but you should know when you actually start working in a design firm or design environment actual environment that the material properties are never deterministic in nature they are always stochastic or statistic they have statistical variation so you will find that if you test a bunch of materials you will find there is a range of the properties and that will basically have probability distribution so you will find that uh, if um, if a material has a specific uh, mean of uh, 210 gigapascal then it can also have uh, as low as 190 gigapascal and as high as 230 gigapascal so there it, it can have a variation and you as a as a design engineer you should know what the variation of the material has or what type of variation material has so it is important to understand that any material properties that you are going to work with is always going to have some statistics into it so just do not only rely on on the mean value of your distribution so does it make sense does my explanation make sense yeah yes yeah so let me randomly pick a student another student for another question now uh, let's say I have here uh, Daniel Lim. Are you here? Daniel Lim. Okay, let's go to Kyle Bloomfield. Kyle Bloomfield, are you here? Yes. Great. So let me ask you as a design engineer, if you get this distribution of material properties, then what will happen if you pick the minimum of that distribution? For example, this, I mean, forget the numbers at this point of time, what the numbers are represented, or let's say the numbers actually show the ultimate tensile strength, right? That's what it is showing. 
So in KPSI, so let's say the ultimate tensile strength has got the mean value of 65 KPSI, kilopounds per square inch. It has got the minimum value of 57 KPS and maximum value of 72 KPS. So as a design engineer, somebody says that you have to use only 57 KPS. Forget about the 65 or 72 value. Just use the 57.5 KPS as a, as a value, ultimate tensile strength in your calculations. What will be the pros and cons for that? What can be the pros and cons for that? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Like, what are you use for the minimum uh, strand? Okay. Or okay, let me explain my question again and let me know if you're not following it. So this is a distribution of tensile strength, ultimate tensile strength. Okay, probably distribution of ultimate tensile strength. But it says that if you test a bunch of materials, you will find this distribution where that means that some of the materials has got 57.5 uh, keeps value some of the materials have got 72.5 kips value and the majority of the materials have got uh, the value 65 kips. Do you understand this much point, okay. yeah. Now, after looking at this distribution, you said I only want to use 57.5 kips value for my design calculation, for finding the factor of safety, for designing the material. Now, what can be wrong with that? Or what can be right with that approach? When I said right with that, is right with that approach or wrong with that approach? It's like the material, I, um, yeah, go ahead. I mean, any anything that comes to your mind, that's fine. Is I, uh, the, uh, the range of the, um, the uh, materials like too white, too white, so it's hard for that. Um, okay, so I think I have not been able to explain my question properly. So let me, uh, let me actually try to reason it. So what happens that this distribution is basically saying that how many uh, sample of materials have got this value of strength, how many sample of materials get this value of 65 kip strength, how many sample of that material gives 72.5 kip strength. Now, if you use 57.5 kip strength as your property, material property for design calculations, what happens that that material that is going to give you a specific uh, component will be very safe. That is a plus part of it, plus side. It will be highly safe. That means it will never fail or it will always be successful in exceeding the service life. So it will always have a high safety part of it, the plus part. The downside is that that part will be very bulky and very have a high, very large amount of weight. The weight will be a lot of, I mean, you have to put a lot of weight because you are taking a less amount of strength. So if you are using this strength value, you will be actually doing a very highly conservative design. Highly conservative design means basically the design will be always fail proof or will always be safe. However, if you actually use this extreme value, you are going to be a very weight optimized structure. The weight will be very, very less, but at the same time, you have a high chance of failure. Are you, seeing, are you guys seeing what I'm trying to say here? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Donnie Park says inconsistency. Sorry, I didn't get what is it about? Sorry, can you please explain? Okay, just give me a second, guys. I'm just looking at the chat window. Okay, so that's not the message about the properties here. So we have got highly conservative design at this end, highly weight optimized design, but very risky. Very risky means it is it can fail and at a very low value, low low stress. I mean low up, up, um, applied load. So it is highly optimized weight and highly conservative. And the middle will basically a trade off between both the weight savings and the strength optimization. Does it make sense to you guys? What I'm talking about here? Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes. So, so as a design engineer, when you actually work in a field, you should probably know that what is the range of the properties you are going to work with. Is that range very broad enough? If it is broad enough, then you have to do the calculations for all the extremes. You have to do the calculations for this extreme. You have to do the calculation for this extreme. And you have to do the calculation for the mean value as well. But if this range is not very broad, for example, if the range is only varying from 6 59 to 62, it does not make much difference. So you can basically do away with the mean, do the calculation with the mean value. So depending on the nature of this probability distribution, you have to make a decision. So that is very important to, to have a knowledge about that. What is the probability distribution of the, uh, of the material properties? And that will give you as an, give you an idea whether you have to look for different extremes or you can basically get away with the mean value of the of the properties does it make sense yeah guys yeah or if you have any questions please let me know okay. yeah yeah that makes sense wait so if not if there are no other questions let me a question yeah there is a question is there a question guys yes there is um, is there like a certain book or something that has all these referenced materials in it? Yeah, your textbook. Shigley's textbook has everything. This is all, all these uh, examples, all these slides are prepared from your textbook. I mean, I mean, the strength of materials, is there like one big book for all the materials that exist to look at? Yes, yes. There are some material handbooks, which actually have all the data properties for all the different types of material that exist so far. Okay. Yeah, there are different material handbooks. If you just uh, search or Google about material handbooks, you will get to know and you can basically get a copy from the library as well that will give you that specific uh, uh, information about any type of materials you would like to know about. But let, I'm just curious, is there any specific material you are interested about or is it just uh, you asked? No, I was just asking if there's any specific book we should get or... Okay, so... For this course, Shigley's textbook is sufficient enough. It has got an appendix at the end, which is which will list all the material properties that you need. And if you even no, need more than that, then when you're actually working in a field or actually working in any organization, I'm sure they, they will have their own material handbooks and reference books, and they will be basically referencing to those data sheets or data 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 catalogs. So okay. For our course, Shigley's textbook is more than enough for both 471 and 472. I mean, when I say more than enough, it's basically till now I'm still reading it and I'm still finding something, some new information every now and then. So, so it is basically a lot of material is there in that textbook itself. So if you can go through that completely, you have a lot of information. Okay, so Having said that, let's go to the next slide. Okay, these are some of the applications for different types of materials, whether it's ferrous, non-ferrous, and you see that um, this is specific uh, slide from one manufacturing engineering and technology um, book. We probably have used it in your 272 class. So the important thing is uh, here, our takeaway message is that different uh, different areas of this component of this design on this, I mean, this uh, body of this car or the frame of this car has basically different type of materials. It's all ferrous materials. Some HSLA basically represents to high strength, low alloy and DPI is basically dual phase and they are different class of materials. And for different class of materials, you have different carbon percentage and that will define how much uh, carbon content it has. The more the carbon content in a material for a ferrous alloy, the more brittle it is and less the carbon content, it is more ductile. So if you increase the carbon content, you are making it more, more, more and more brittle, brittleness in it. So you will, I mean, this is just for a reference, but the important thing, again, the thought answer, thought provoking answers or questions are that if you have different types of materials that are bonded together or fused together. See, if you have HSLA and now you have DP dual phase and HSLA and DP has to be joined together, right? These are not, first of all, the question is that why not I use 
dual phase material for the whole car body why not i use a single material for the whole body so what can be your 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 observations or inferences do you see my question guys wait no. yes yeah, sorry go ahead can you repeat the question one more time so my question is why not have a uniformity of material throughout why have to have different materials for different different parts or different areas or different regions why oh. do some design engineers select hsla for these regions bp dual phase steel for these regions and similarly why different types of materials why not uniform material for all you them? you have to uh think about so like some materials like let's say the roof has to be a certain material in case you roll the car so it might mm -hmm. be it might take more impact and then like the front and the rear have to either be very hard or very soft to uh, to absorb impact also yes 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 exactly like that yeah so depending on the design requirement what you're actually pointing is the right direction that depending on different application or different uh, different requirement or load bearing surfaces you will have different types of materials so some you want to optimize the remember every time um, you actually come across a good design or best design is basically is uh, has to have an optimized weight and optimized strength and op and also at a low cost so you have strength weight cost and manufacturing process manufacturability these are three or four um, four um, areas that are always to be considered while you are looking or working on a design so if you think about optimizing the strength you probably would have think thought about okay using all high strength low alloy because it has got high strength so if i use all the high all the material all the body with high strength i will always have strength optimized structure but the downside of that would be that the high strength material will be more expensive and it will also result in um, more weight basically or i wouldn't say more weight high strength basically result in less weight but it will result in more expensive and the manufacturability will be also a bit different because high strength is basically is not that much easily manufacturable or is not form formable so so you have to as a designer you have to do the trade offs between strength optimization weight optimization cost optimization and manufacturability of the of the different comforts and that is why you actually see different parts will have different uh, components and they all serve different purposes now is is it making sense to you guys so far uh yes yeah yes. yeah yeah so the other issue with this type of optimization i mean now everybody is with me or you are agree that you probably need different types of materials for different areas or different regions of the component or design just because you want to optimize the strength you optimize the weight in some areas you want to optimize the cost and you want to optimize the manufacturability so to optimize all the different parameters you are basically selecting different materials for different areas everybody agrees with me so far right yes yes, yes. Yeah. yeah now if you agree with me and with this design what happens that when you have different materials and they need to be joined together and when they are joining getting joined together that is a very challenging part or challenging uh, problem for a designer because then you have to deal with issues about interfaceability or interfacing or um, how should i say it is basically compatibility of the two materials at the interfaces so if the two materials are not compatible with each other when i say compatible the most Uh, basic compatibility problem happens in thermal expansion and contraction so this type of any component any design component whether it is a car whether it is some chassis whether it is some uh, turbine whether it is something else they have an environment which keeps on changing the environment does not remain static so you can think of a car which may work in in frigid environments in the arctic or basically at sub zero temperatures or it may you may basically have the same car same material working in a desert area in probably areas where we have 120 100 degree fanice so if you have a specific design that works on different environments you will see you will have different rate of expansion and contraction in different material because each material has its own expansion and contraction rate so if they have a mismatch then what happens at 
the joint and interfaces, there will be a lot of stresses will build up because at that there is no compatibility in the material that at the point of where they are interfacing with each other. And that basically gives is a very challenging problem for the design engineer to make sure that their uh, the design has incorporates some features which lets the material to expand, which are high expanding materials to expand freely. Otherwise, what will happen, the stresses will develop and the material will fail. So that is one of the issue that you should be, uh, you should be uh, considerate about or you should consider while you are working with material, different types of materials in one specific design. Am I making sense to you guys? Yes. Yes. So that is one uh, very important uh, consideration and very challenging aspect. I mean, this is also one of the currently ongoing research problem in, uh, in, in hybrid structures or basically in aircraft structures where they are using composites and materials or basically high strength aluminum. So while if you remember, if you know about composites, it is just carbon fiber composites, or you probably know about composites by now because it's very much used in many applications. So carbon fiber composites and glass fiber composites, they are different composites which have, which are very lightweight and high strength. And these type of materials are generally used in aerospace structures. And till now, uh, even now the aerospace structures, any structures is not like all made up of composite. So it has some portion which has got composite, some portion which has got uh, aluminum and some portion which has got titanium and so on and so forth. And when you mix different types of materials together, then there is a problem about this thermal expansion and contraction and which, con which leads to thermal stresses and the material will start failing soon rather than late. So if you are not uh, captured or if you have not thought about those challenges and those issues, then the design will not be sound, safe and sound. So that is one of the important research challenges which is still going on about how to have an optimized composite structure with material or which has a compatibility with materials or metals basically. Okay, so having said that, I guess the next application is almost the same as we discussed. It is for non test materials, but now it is basically for turbine engine and you actually see that you have different um, components as different materials so fans have got titanium alloys the shroud or the cover which has got a different alloy and they have different uh, basically specific purposes to solve so so depending on what uh, specific application you are trying to work with you have to select a material and again the as a designer you have to basically be careful about using different types of materials because then you have to worry about how they will interact with each other. Okay. So any questions so far guys? Okay. If not, then uh, this, uh, this slide basically represents the, the tool a very useful tool that is available for the design engineers is to select a material for a given application. So here you actually see a lot of materials that have been plotted, whether it is lead alloys, zinc, polymers, then you have foams and you have rubber and you have ceramics over there. So there are different types of materials and they have been grouped and classified based on the plot of Young's modulus and the density. So depending on uh, their density value and their stiffness value, the materials are basically plotted in this chart. And these are basically called as S-based chart. And this helps the designer in finding out a specific material for a specific choice. For example, if you want a low density material and low stiffness material, you are going to work with these applications, foams and polymers. If you want high stiffness materials, high stiffness materials since their Young's modulus is very high, but at the same time, you want to have a low density as well. That means then you are working in an area which is, which is governed by composite, ceramics, aluminum alloys, and so on and so forth. If you do not care about the weight part, which is highly unlikely because in many applications, the weight is very critical. 
So if you are not concerned about the weight, but the strength and stiffness, then you will go for steels and nickel alloys and tungsten and so on and so forth, where the weight is not a concern because the density is very, very high, but at the same time, you are getting high stiffness. So here you see there is a lot of material choices are available and depending on what, uh, what specific, uh, specific requirement is, whether it is, com whether it is related to your stiffness, whether it is related to your density, you can choose your, uh, you can choose the material or you can have the option of materials from this chart. Are you guys getting it? What I'm trying to say here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Any questions guys so far? Okay. So another thing is uh, these guidelines. These guidelines are nothing but the lines which actually are, are the ratio of the Young's modulus raised to the power certain exponents divided by the density. So if you have uh, simply the ratio of E over rho, that is basically the stiffness divided by the density, that is the case for axial loading. So those components, design component that only undergoes axial loading, you only need to worry about the plot of E divided by rho. And this is basically represented by these dashed lines. And these dashed lines, if you draw parallel lines, we actually draw, go like this. So what each line represents that the E over rho remains constant. That means for axial loading, any material that remains on this line will do the equal job. So if I am, the, I am on this line, E over rho, and I, I mean E over rho basically means density divided, sorry, stiffness divided by the density, then any material that crosses this line, whether it is now composite, whether it is now uh, or ceramics or any other material that will be sufficient for that application. Now the third part that will be important for me is the cost. So whether CFRP composite is costlier than ceramic or ceramic is costlier than something else, that will, will be the deciding criteria for a specific application. So if you are worrying about bending loads, then for bending loads, you are going to plot the ratio of square root of E divided by rho, which is this line. Now you can draw this line, which you can draw parallel lines to this and you can find how many materials cross that uh, specific dashed line or the guidelines. And that will give you a choice of materials for a specific application. So I'll come back to this. Specific um, telling you that if you plot the ratio of square root of E divided by the density, you actually see that the lines are basically shown. It says that this line is when the ratio is 0.1, this is 0 0.3, 0 0.1, so and 3, and so on and so forth. So, increasing value of this index will give you the 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 material choices which are good for bending, bending applications or the low applications where bending load is dominant from is very important is very significant and any material that crosses this line has the same almost the same uh, response from the mechanical perspective from the from the from the deformation perspective so the foam uh, and the composite and some other metals if they are lying on this line, they will have the same uh, sim uh, similar response for the bending application. The only thing is now you have lightweight material versus higher, higher weight material. That's it. Does it make sense, guys? Yeah. yeah. So, that uh, another thing on this chart is basically a constraint line. Line um, constraint basically means a hard number that I'm imposing. If I'm saying that for my material or for my choice, I should not have a stiffness which is less than 50 gigapascal. That means I'm ruling out all the options that are lying on this line, which is basically uh, have this have the stiffness less than 50 gigapascal. So as I was mentioning to you, this line represents that any material that lie on this line has the same bending response. That means under the applied of bending load, they will undergo the same bending stresses and deflection. But at the same time, if I want my stiffness should not be less than 50 gigapascal, that means I cannot use foams, I cannot use polymers, I cannot use wood, I cannot use anything which has the stiffness less than 50 gigapascal. Then I have to consider all the materials that are basically which higher than 
the TGR Pascal stiffness. Does that make sense to you now? Yes. Yeah? Uh, yes. Yes. So that is basically a very important, uh, as I say, material section tool, uh, which are available to us, which will help you to decide on uh, the class of materials that you can consider for your application, depending on the specific uh, in value or specific uh, range of this, uh, this ratio of uh, stiffness divided by the density. So if you are just plotting E divided by rho, you are basically worrying about the axial. Here you actually see the plot of E divided by rho. This is simply for axial loads. And if you are worrying about the square root of E divided by rho divided by the density, then this is basically these lines represent the, the similar material response under bending loads or bending so far yeah yes so similarly we have for strength just like we had for stiffness versus density this is for strength versus density and now the exponent actually changes for bending it is not over two it is two over three so you application for strength versus density and for stiffness versus density. So the idea remains just the same. Okay, so having said that, any questions so far, guys? Anybody has any questions so far? If not, then uh, we will wrap up this lecture with this case study for designing a centrifuge. Now I'm just giving a five to 10 minutes for you guys to look at this link and look at yourself, what the centrifuge means, how it works. And then after five or 10 minutes, around, around 10 minutes, I will come back and uh, we'll wrap up our lecture session with a design calculation for this centrifuge. We have got an idea about what a centrifuge is by now. You can watch the video later on after this. Uh, session so uh, let me come back to our design requirement so if you have to design a centrifuge or basically say basically the components of the centrifuge then uh, how are you going to use the knowledge that you have so far about the the deformables the dynamics and how you're going to select a material for the for the centrifuge arm so so you know probably by now that you you need a carriage which has the material in it and the centrifuge actually basically consists of a spinning motor at the center and it has got an arm and the arm actually uh, is extended up to the carriage where the carriage holds the material and it spins and you need a symmetrically placed carriages because you want it to be uh, balanced so if that is the system how will you decide on the selection of material for the arm of the centrifuge? So given these design, calc or design requirements, how will you start the calculation? So here you first have to basically select the material based on the amount of stress that is coming in it. So the stresses can be com computed only if you know the amount of load that is, being applied. So if you know this arm is basically spinning at angular velocity omega, which is constant, and the mass that are placed at a distance r from the center is given by P kilonewton divided by the gravity, acceleration due to gravity. So what will be the force that you will think the arm will actually get or arm will experience? Let me actually share the document camera with you probably so what we are basically discussing here is that you have the centrifuge the spinning motor and then you have this arm you have a symmetric arm located at this end and you have the carriage and the carriage has got mass which i mean it has got weight p so if it has a uh, P kilonewtons, 
So you know the mass of this carriage and you have a carriage here as well. And this is your arm. This is your carriage which contains the object. And this is basically spinning about the center, center with a constant angular velocity omega. So what would be the forces that will come in the system? Can anybody volunteer? Would it be torque? Uh, the torque is basically provided by the motor and the spinning. But when it is spinning at a constant angular velocity omega, what is the force that this mass will experience? So this is a mass. Mass is basically given by P divided by acceleration due to gravity. So this is the mass of this object at the carriage. What is the force that this mass will experience when it is rotating or spinning at this angular velocity, constant angular velocity omega? Centripetal force. Yeah, exactly. And what will be that equals to? Mass times velocity squared over radius. Okay, yeah, you can say that. Or you can also say that it is mR omega square, which is basically acting radially outwards, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah. Are you guys with me? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah just... The same, same amount of centrifugal force will be acting at this end, which will be given by mR omega square, where R is your, your distance, I mean, radial distance from the center to the carriage. And mass is the mass, which is basically sitting at this point and omega is the angular velocity. So mass times radius times omega squared. This is the centrifugal force that is going to be applied or going to be acted on this mass, on this carriage. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that means this arm is basically experiencing a uniaxial load. So if you look at this arm as a whole, then this arm is nothing, but it is, it is basically undergoing a uniaxial, it is under, under the uniaxial load, which is given by M R omega square. And if you have this scenario, can you find the stress in the material? This is your arm now. Can you find the stress in the material? Stress, if you remember, it is simply for uniaxial load case, not always. For uniaxial load case, is forced by the cross sectional area. Cross sectional area is not known to us. So sigma for uniaxial, always remember it is only for uniaxial, not always. So for uniaxial load case, stress is given by the ratio of force divided by the area. Area, I do not know, so I assume that the cross section is as, as a round shape, is a diameter. So I have Fc divided by pi by four d square. That is my stress. If it has to be less than yield stress of the material, divided by factor of safety or design factor of safety. That basically will give me the diameter. I mean, solve for diameter. Assuming a specific choice of material. with a specified factor of safety. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Does it make sense to everybody? Yes. Yeah, yes. that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. 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 So everybody is comfortable. So let me ask uh, a random student from the list of attendees here. Just let me look at. Do we have Cynthia Diaz? Diaz. Cynthia. Yes. Okay. So you are comfortable with this explanation, right? So far. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what is this sigma yield? Isn't that the proportional yield of the material? And what is that material? 
will get the value. How will you solve for diameter? We have to solve for diameter, right? How will you solve for this diameter? You need to know this. How will you get this value? That's my question, sir. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. So, what I am basically trying to lead you here is that if you look at this specific expression, you guys are all comfortable with me. I mean, you are guys with me so far at this point of time. Am I correct? Yes. Now, if I look at these expressions, there are so many terms. F C, which is M R omega square. Mass is known to me. Radius is known to me. Omega is known to me. So I know everything about F subscript C. I do not know diameter and here again, I assume the diameter because I assume the cross section is circular. So diameter, I'm not sure what it should be. This has to be a specific number and you are correct that it is basically the yield limit of a material, but what material I'm choosing. So here you will see that you have to make an assumption that you have to assume a specific material. It can, you can say that, okay, my arm is going to be made up of wood. Then for wood, what is the yield limit or what is the proportional limit you are going to pick for that will you have to use that value if somebody says i'm going to use this arm with aluminum then for that aluminum what should be the yield limit that you are going to use if somebody says i'm going to use my arm using composite then for composite what should be the value that you are going to use so depending on this assumed choice you are going to have this value does that make sense guys yes so the important part to where i am trying to lay stress is is this part the assumption and as a design engineer you will find that in many places you have to keep on making assumptions and when you are making assumptions there has to be some reasoning for that you just cannot just make an assumption that i am going to select sigma yield as let's say 500 gigapascal just for the sake of uh, just for the sake of uh, doing the calculations, I'm going to select this. So you cannot just take this value randomly. Even if this has to be an assume, but that assumption should have a basis depending on what material you are choosing. So you have to make assumptions as a design engineer. That's number one. Number two is your assumption should have a reasoning, specific reasoning for that. Just because the, value, the variables are given, you're just not going to randomly pick those numbers. So that is what I'm I, I would like to uh, stress on or put emphasis on. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah? Yes. 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 And the same thing you have to do for this design factor of safety because this is not known to me. Nobody is going to give you. So, so far, um, whatever courses you have done, whatever um, studies you have completed so far, you, have, you would have got questions and you have got problem sets where these values would have been given to you. Somebody would have mentioned sigma yield is this value, this factor of safety is 1.5 or 2, 2.5. Calculate and find diameter or calculate FC, whatever it is. But now going forward, most of the information will not be provided to you. You have to basically take that information or you have to assume that information or get that information by yourself. And for that, uh, you also have to assume. And for that assumption, you must have a specific reason. Without a reasoning, the assumption is just like a fiction. So we don't want to design something without a fiction. So that is the important part that you also have to learn while going forward that most of the things will not be provided to you. Most of the information will be just like, uh, will not be present in, in, in the problems. And you have to make an assumption and you should have a proper reasoning for that. So with that, I would like to wrap up this session and let me know if you guys have any questions so far. Or if you are good so far? Um, can we go back to the Ion? So you said we should assume a material to use. Oh, sorry about I'm, that. So, I'm sorry, I didn't get your oh. question. Can you please explain again? Um, going back to the uh, the uh, material uh, yield. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let's say we want to use a material for one of our design, and then you want us to give a reason for 
the why we picked the material. Exactly. Yeah. You you have to provide me a reason why you are picking that material. Um, let's say for go, uh, using centrifuge as a we want to use steel because it has a a higher yield strength. You may say that somebody, some other designer will say, no, I don't want to use steel because it is very weight or it has got a lot of weight. So I want to use aluminum. Somebody will say, I will not use the aluminum because it has got high thermal coefficient of expansion and contraction. I don't want to use uh, aluminum. Somebody will say, I want to use some ceramic. So somebody will say, no, ceramic is not good because it has, it is brittle. It will may fracture very easily and it will shatter into pieces, pieces and it will not be easy to work with when the failure happens. So there are so many pros and cons for every material that you are going to select and no answer is correct or no answer is wrong rather than saying that correct. No answer is wrong. Every answer supported by reasoning is correct. Does that make sense? Yes. So any choice of material supported by a valid reasoning is correct. So you can select wood, you can select Ceramic, you can select glass, you can select aluminum, you can select whatever material you can think of, you can like, but there has to be a proper reasoning behind that. If you provide that reasoning, you are good. You are good too. All right, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, any other questions, guys? Uh, I just had a quick question. Uh, is that stress? Is that a uh, stress or strain that you have the unit axial and the yield? See, it's a stress. Oh, stress, okay. This is force divided by area. That is stress. That's basically the for uniaxial stress. It is force divided by area. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions so far? Okay. If not, then let's wrap up today's session. And uh, I will see some of you guys in the Wednesday's lab session. Again, the lab sessions will start 30 minutes late. So it will be 9.30 in the morning and 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon. So we will have, we, I will meet you guys in the Wednesday lab sessions.